Divorce sucks, especially when you're the pawn in the middle of shared holidays, custody disputes. Generally speaking, no child likes when their parents have to divorce. 13-year-old Dylan Redwine was caught in a twister of a bad divorce between his parents, Mark Redwine and Elaine Hall. Now, it is rather normal for a child to dread leaving the comfort of their home, their environment, their friends, and you know, having to go spend the holiday visitation with the other parent who gets the part-time custody. So naturally, when Dylan was scheduled to spend his Thanksgiving holiday with his father, Mark, back in 2012, he wasn't looking forward to it. But it wasn't just the divorce. Dylan knew something about his dad, Mark. Something real dark, twisted, grotesque. Mark had some gnarly secrets. It's been assumed that Dylan had eventually confronted his father, Mark, about Mark's secret. And that was just not gonna fly with Mark. This story will most likely and should definitely get you to second guess who you're sending your kids to spend their time with. Even so much as a sleepover. Like, man, you think you know someone. I'm Chelsea J. Welcome to Crime Light. Please don't forget to subscribe to the channel and regarding the video, if you end up loving it, please be sure to give it a like. Dylan didn't really look up to Mark. They had a relationship, but it was never what Dylan had wanted. It was always what Mark had wanted, which was always to be on the road. Really? Never there. Okay. Ever meet someone who's just off? Uncomfortable demeanor, blank eyes, defensive, argumentative? That's Mark Redwine. Just the first impression alone gives me Predator vibes. Now come Thanksgiving 2012, Dylan is less than enthused about having to go spend Thanksgiving with this guy, Mark. It's his dad, but I don't think in Dylan's heart he was really seeing Mark as his father at this point in time. Just 12 years old and he's already getting confused about who this really weird guy, Mark, is to Dylan. You see, Dylan knew a secret and it had him feeling a certain way about Mark. Dylan was just 12 years old when he discovered this secret and ever since, Mark was just a weird, scary, and strange man to Dylan. Someone that Dylan didn't really know anymore and someone that he certainly didn't feel comfortable with. So the year before, in 2011, Dylan would be 12 years old when he showed his brother, Corey, pictures on his father Mark's computer of Mark Redwine dressed in a wig, woman's lingerie, and eating what appeared to be feces from a diaper. I can't actually feature the photos here, so I'm just gonna leave the link down below. And if you can stomach it, definitely give it a go. Give it your best shot. This guy, Mark, was straight up enjoying the process. Straight up nasty, naughty, licking it up. Dressed like a woman while he's doing it. Caught somewhere between a woman, a infant, and a man. Now, we titled the video Fetish, but that feels more like an identity crisis to me. Dylan had accidentally discovered these photos on Mark's computer during a road trip in 2011 while Mark was spending time with Dylan and Corey during a custody visit. While Mark was sleeping in the other room, the siblings, they locked themselves in the motel bathroom and they ended up looking at the photos. Originally, Dylan had stumbled upon those photos. Corey was on the phone with his girlfriend at the time and Dylan's like, hey bro, come here. Like he can't stand himself. He didn't even know what to do. So he's like, I gotta show you something. Get off the phone. So Corey knows it's serious. He gets in the bathroom, locks it, and they look. And Corey ended up taking pictures on his cell phone of the photos of Mark. Wearing women's clothing with feces and the diaper just like a little baby. Well, let's fast forward to about a year later. It's August 2012 and Dylan is stuck on a road trip with Mark alone. Now, Mark is the kind of guy that he's, he pokes the bear, okay? We'll get into that in a second, but he was starting problems with his son, Corey, from afar. Even though it's Mark and Dylan on the road trip solo, you know, he's texting Corey, confronting him with photos of proof. You know, Corey's underage, you've been drinking, you left your mess with your girlfriend at a residence, and Corey's like, oh, really? We want to go there, huh? Okay, well, I got some photos, too. He attaches the photos of Mark's 
doo-doo escapade, and he loses his temper on his dad. I mean, this is total beyond skeletons in the closet disturbing. This is like, what is even happening? I'm not even gonna ask you to imagine it. Just listen to the story. So Corey, he's upset. He calls his father a poo eating coward, and he says, you are what you eat, which is quite a hell of a comeback, to be honest with you. <laughs> That's a hard act to follow. Somebody's telling you something like that. Now, despite the evidence, the proof, the big secret coming out into light between Corey and Mark, even though Dylan was alone with Mark on that road trip, Dylan was not harmed at this time. But, you know, Dylan and Mark no longer had a good relationship by this point in time either. At one point, Dylan got really upset. He got upset with Mark and he was arguing with Mark and Mark's being a big child and arguing back and Dylan reached out to Corey. He's like, hey, do you have those pictures of Papa? Because honestly, man, this guy, something else. I'm, I'm ready. I'm, I'm like ready to be the man in this situation. Somebody's got to say it. Somebody's got to put this guy in his place. Like he was ready for a call to action, right? He's ready to face his father like a big boy and just be like, you know what? Nah, check this out. I mean, reminder, Mark's a schmuck. He thinks that his shit don't stink, like literally. And he's the kind of guy that talks down on others to build himself up. Like Mark is low, he's real low. So he puts others lower in order to be higher. And Dylan saw that in his father's character. He loved his mother and his brother Corey very, very much. And Mark was the kind of guy that had to take people and place them underneath Mark to feel better about himself. So it really agitated Dylan to hear Mark scold and belittle Elaine, his mother and his brother Corey. So, you know, Dylan wants to finally confront the guy about his shit. I need to stop. So come Thanksgiving 2012, Dylan's pretty much forced to spend Thanksgiving with Mark. Corey fortunately had turned 18 years old by this point, and so he didn't actually legally have to go visit. And because he didn't have to, he chose not to, which says a lot about how much these boys really just didn't want to see Mark if they could help it. It should be noted that Elaine Mark's ex-wife and Mark, they both lived within Colorado, but they lived hours away, approximately six. So Elaine takes Dylan to the airport. Dylan boards a plane and he heads out to Bayfield, Colorado, where he's forced to meet this very strange man, Mark, to spend the holiday. On November 18th of 2012, around 6 p.m., Mark picked up Dylan from the airport. They made a stop at Walmart, and then upon Dylan's request, they decided to go through a drive through at McDonald's. Reason being, Dylan didn't want to have a sit-down meal with this guy. Like, he knows what he saw. You know, he's, he doesn't want to sit across the table with this guy and look, watch this guy eating more than he already saw. You know what I'm saying? Mark's like, let's just have a sit-down meal, and Dylan's like, no, bro. I'm actually hungry, and I really do want to eat my food, so I'm just going to take the drive through and, you know, I'm just going to, like, look out the window, and I'll just watch the birds and mountains or something while I eat my cheeseburger. I can't look at you. You know, that's what I'm assuming, he thought. We do know for a fact Mark wanted to hang out with his son on a sit-down meal. Dylan's, like, not having it. In fact, Dylan's so not having it that he requested out the gate, hey, you know what? Do you mind if I go stay at my friend's house for the night? He had to play it, you know? I'm really excited to be here, and oh my god, you know, I'm, like, 13 right now, and I want to go hang out with one of my friends. I just got in town. I haven't seen him, you know? Mark's like, no. To Dylan's demise, Mark actually forced Dylan to stay in his secluded cabin with him that evening. And so Dylan's like, damn, dude. Okay, all right, plan B. So Dylan makes wicked early plans to see his friend. He's like, yo, I can't stay with you tonight, but 6.30 a.m., be there. I'm just gonna sleep with like one eye open on my dad's couch and then like, yeah, we're gonna go hang out, okay, tomorrow. On November 19th, it said that Dylan was still sleeping on the couch around 7 a.m. And this is by Mark, said by Mark. Mark says that he decided when he saw his son asleep, he was gonna go run some errands and he ended up returning to the cabin at 11.30 a.m. At this time, he said when he pulled in, the cabin door was wide open. He's like, all right, what's going on? He walks in, there's Nickelodeon blaring on the TV. Dylan's nowhere to be found, but there's a fresh bowl of cereal nearby. So, you know, he decides to not worry about it because kids be kids. He decides he's gonna go take a nap. Now that's the standpoint of Mark's thought process. If I'm to be real with you right now, I know I just said all 
all that, oh, kids be kids? No. When you got a 13-year-old child staying his first official day in your home and you haven't seen him all morning, that thought process goes away. You don't go take a nap. You do call your son. You do try to get in touch with him. But Dylan's cell phone, backpack, and fishing pole were not present. And so Mark assumes it's safe to go take a nap because he can't find his son and kids be kids. Mark says he wakes up at 1 p.m. and his son is still not around. After checking with some friends, some neighbors, kind of riding up the roads, Mark alleges that he went to go make a report about Dylan being nowhere around. So Mark allegedly reports to authorities. Allegedly, while Mark was reporting to authorities, he contacted his ex-wife, Elaine. Now, Mark and Elaine had a horrific divorce. They had been married to each other from 1989 to 2007. And Mark was said to be really aggressive and mean with Elaine. This is something that Corey and Dylan had to witness before the divorce. And so even before the doo-doo pics, they didn't have a lot of respect left. Like the pictures was the straw that broke the camel's back. Prior to that, Mark didn't have very good standing with his kids, let alone his ex-wife. So we know at this point that Elaine really doesn't like Mark. Like she's tolerating Mark because they share children together. And she knows better than anyone, man. I mean, she had to be married to the guy. She had to bear his kids. Like she probably knows way more than I can narrate in this story just how off this guy really was. So when Mark had contacted Elaine and asked Elaine, hey, do you happen to know where Dylan was? I can only imagine the pins and needles running through her body that was shocking her system at that moment. I can't fill in any kind of words for Elaine because I haven't been there myself. So I'm just gonna tell you like exactly what Elaine had to say. Elaine said it was so surreal. You don't expect any of this to happen, you know? I feel I figured he was safe because he's with his dad. And I was devastated to learn that no one knew where my son was. Now, Elaine recalls the entire experience from her angle in sending her son to spend this year 2012 Thanksgiving with her ex-husband, Mark. She said the last time she would ever see her son, the last hug she would ever share with him, she told Dylan, oh, you think you're too old to give your mom a hug, huh? And Dylan comes running back and he gushed in her arms and they held each other one final time. That would be the last time in both their lifetimes that they would ever hold each other. This would be goodbye unknowingly between Dylan and his mother. So Dylan and his mother communicated very frequently through text. That evening, evening on November 18th around 10 p.m., she had stopped hearing from her son Dylan. Now, it's probably later afternoon on the 19th, like a whole night and an entire half day at least has passed before Elaine's hearing that Mark doesn't know where her son is at. Like, she has not heard from her son. This is scary. So, she recalled that she was in her car driving home when she got that text. She's like, I'm frantic. Why are you asking me? I am hours away. She knew that she had to take matters into her own hands. She actually told Mark, I'm suspect of you because his demeanor was just so weird. This was a very serious thing going on. So she goes home, takes matters into her own hands, grabs her son, her husband, packs a bag, gets in the vehicle, and they book it to the Durango area where she immediately starts putting in a report for a missing person. Plot twist on Mark being at the station reporting anything. He never reported shit. They did not have a report on Dylan being missing and they know nothing about this, not until Elaine called it to their attention. So up until this point, we actually know that Dylan is missing. We know for a fact that he got off the plane the day before. We know that he was at Walmart and they went through McDonald's and we know that he made it to the cabin. But by 6.30 in the morning, Dylan's friend said he did not see Dylan and he did not hear from Dylan. And at some point or another, he actually ended up texting, hey, dude, your dad's looking for you. Are you okay? Like, he's a young kid thinking he's gotten stood up by his friend, but now he's aware that his friend is kind of missing, you know? But now we know that nobody had ever heard from Dylan again past 10 p.m. on the 18th of November. So this is Mark's thought process. Idiot thought process is what I call it. He comes up with this theory that Dylan probably walked nine and a half miles to his friend's house from Mark's cabin all the way to his friend's house. But in Elaine's heart, she 
knew this was bullshit. She knew he was reaching, and she knew he must have been involved. Like, it wouldn't be too much longer before Elaine would start coming out about being pretty paranoid on her ex-husband's involvement with her son missing. So a search and rescue team starts looking for Dylan right away. And in Colorado, in that region, it is not easy to search for someone. The elevations are steep. The conditions of where they thought Dylan might be, they're really difficult to pull off a search. It's not just, you know, flat land and a walk in the park. Like, this is a wide range of possibility on where Dylan could be at this point. We're talking about at least, according to Mark, a whole day where he's been missing. At this point, they're using drones and canine units. Thanksgiving arrived and Dylan was not present for this holiday. And of course, on Elaine's side, it's unfathomable. Signs went up, a reward gets offered. I mean, this goes viral. It's national headlines at this point. Dylan also had a half-brother from Arizona. He packed up his family and he drove all the way to Colorado to try to help find Dylan. And he also had a strained relationship with his father, Mark, too. The whole time, Mark did not budge. He stuck to like one theory only. He stuck to the timeline of this really weird story that people were starting to catch on that, you know, he might've made this up or something. This is weird. Eventually, they ended up checking Mark's home where they ended up finding not a whole lot of it, but little splashes of blood that most likely belonged to Dylan. And his girlfriend at the time, they tried to sort of cover this with, you know, well, Dylan cut his finger when he was there or, you know, there was, there was some kind of excuse that just, it was, it was BS, you guys. And the more that Mark got questioned, the more defensive he became. It, it came to be less about finding Dylan and it came to be a whole lot more about covering Mark's ass, which, you know, the only time that Mark actually wanted any kind of attention at all was if national headlines could paint Mark to look like the victim, which would happen twice. One would be when Mark Mark thinks that he went into an alleged panic attack. He contacted a reporter so they would come out and interview him and take pictures of him and, you know, make him this big celebrity dad missing his son. You know, of course, making him look like the victim. And the other time would be when the family would go on to Dr. Phil's show by 2013. It's also said that he did not search for Dylan past maybe one time. There was search parties. There was media coverage on it. The only time that he wanted attention was if he looked like the father victim of circumstance. After that, he was like, keep the attention away from me. Let's keep it on the victim. Dylan needs us. Which, you know, sound familiar? Chris Watts, Scott Peterson, when these people commit familicide, that's a pretty typical pattern for the men to want to be embraced by the public and felt sorry for and yet have no hands-on moves on finding their family. They'll take media attention if you can feel bad for them. But after that, they know what happened to the victim. They know what happened to their family members. So in their world, they're ready to move on. It's just a matter of the timeline of events just, you know, dying down a little so they can move on with their lives. That's always their hope. So when I actually discovered this story back in 2013, this was actually on the Dr. Phil show. And I'll say to this day and all day long, Dr. Phil's the king. So Dr. Phil could see past Mark and it wasn't really hard to to notice even from an audience standpoint that Mark was just turning his son and his ex-wife in circles. Just very defensive excuses, excuses for his son disappearance. He was less than helpful. I'm not involved in this. No matter how it comes across, whether it be to you or anybody else, I'm not involved in this. And I have a hard time dealing with this. I struggle with this every day. And, and, and for months now, I've I, I got Corey and Elaine pointing their finger at me. In the end, Mark did not want to actually cooperate with taking a polygraph test, even though he originally said, sure, I will. You should be doing backflips right now to take this polygraph test. You were the last person to have seen your son before he disappeared. Do you know where he is? No, I don't. If you're innocent, we're the best friends you ever found. Boy, I, I, I just struggle with this whole thing. Just to kind of save face in front of the audience. And not only that, but he kind of smashed on Dr. Phil behind Dr. Phil's back. And of course, Dr. Phil was notified about it. So, you know, Dr. Phil, he a king. And he really let Mark have it. So, hey. Then the next morning, just when the test was getting started, Mark said he didn't feel well. 
an automatic disqualifier. Red flag 5,648 with Mark is that his ex-wife, Betsy, actually called in a tip to investigators. So yeah, Mark's been divorced twice and prior to Dylan, Corey, and his ex-wife, Elaine, came Betsy and their two children that he shared with her. Betsy mentioned that quite honestly, Mark was very abusive to her and toward the kids. And she mentioned that at one point, he just kind of came out of the woodwork and mentioned if he were to ever do something to someone, then he would hide the body in the mountains. He knew what to do if something like that were to happen. So she just had a really bad feeling for Dylan. There was also a custody dispute between Betsy and Mark over their two children as well. So this guy has a bit of a pattern going on. In June of 2013, Dylan Redwine's partial remains were discovered. Two years later, they ended up actually finding Dylan's skull. Hikers came upon it. Can you imagine just like one beautiful day out in the mountains of Colorado and you find a missing person? This was actually a real exclusive giveaway considering they were able to see that the skull had blunt force trauma to it. Well, you know how Mark's just a weirdo. I mean, we knew that with the whole diaper cross-dressing thing, but, you know, then he talks about how he would dump a body and where he would dump it. Well, this guy talks too much. He just runs his mouth like he knows everything. He ended up telling his other son from Betsy's side that if they don't find the skull, then they can't find out that Dylan would have had blunt force trauma. Therefore, this now makes Mark the prime suspect. Mark would say something so delusional and such a hot hint toward the case, and suddenly it all happens. Yeah. So Mark gets arrested in 2017 and charged. And at the time, he was truck driving out in Washington. Now, after a very long, drawn-out process, which painful for the victims of the circumstance, Dylan's family, the real family, the people that really care about him, not the stranger, the freak on the side that does nothing and knows everything about what happened to Dylan, but the real people that really loved him. This was so painful. Long story short, Mark Redwine was actually found guilty of murdering his 13-year-old son back in 2012 and sentenced to 48 years in prison. Now, I'm going to be very personal with you for a moment. I don't have a custody agreement with anyone from my past. I am very fortunate that my children are in my care and it will be that way forever. But it doesn't mean that I'm home free on things not going wrong in their lives. Listen, my kids, they talk to other people, adults included. They encounter other people. And it really blows my mind to think about how I actually don't have full control over the environment that they'll be in, the paths that they cross, and the people that they encounter. It's really weird to think that this could happen to anyone and I somehow have to trust the process of life because some people are crazy. But I did learn a valuable lesson from Dylan's mom, Elaine. She actually came back to Dr. Phil and her and her son, Corey, gave a statement about how they're doing and how they're getting through without Dylan, Corey's brother, Elaine's son. What was cool about Elaine was her strength. She said that this was not the world that had done this to her or to her son, but this was just one man in the world that did it. She said that she never thought she would be the mother that had to survive after her son's death. I thought it was really neat that she didn't blame everyone and everything for this happening to her. I thought it was really grand of her to come out and say, I know that Mark did this. She didn't go around hating her life and blaming everyone for this happening. Like, don't trust anyone, you know? And she actually talked about how great and awesome humanity and the communities have been to her and her family during this time. Because when you are a parent and you hear things like this happen, it terrifies you. Especially when a mother that loses their child says something along the lines of, 
yeah, this could happen to anyone. She's not wrong, but I thought it was really neat that she made it very clear that we don't need to live in fear as much as we just need to be aware. It was really cool to see that she didn't lose all of her faith in humanity after this devastating tragedy. So instead of being totally afraid for my children, their futures, and all these people that I don't know what their fetish is and their secret habits are and all those things, I just need to be very aware of my children, their surroundings, what my gut feeling says. And to be honest with you, I feel very sorry for Elaine and Dylan and Corey that they had to even put up with Mark and his weird, chaotic demeanor. Because to me, out the gate, he is weird. He was very weird, even long before the secret would come out, just even looking into his eyes and realizing that he doesn't have the best history of being a loving father or a good husband. Just huge red flags for me. So the moral of the story is we don't have to live in fear, but we do need to stay woke. We need to stay aware for our loved ones. So what did you guys think about Dylan's story? Pretty wild, huh? Oh, my heart goes out to Corey, Elaine, her husband, Dylan's siblings, and his friends. It's a hard story. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. I'm Chelsea J. I will be seeing you next week for another case. Crime Light out.